a big shout out tonight to all of our friends following us from What's Up Noop. Thanks, Ryan, um, and thanks for the extra promotion. If you haven't heard of us, we're a documentary screening series, and we are switching to this virtual world. So every week, we're going to be bringing a different documentary title to your homes. Um, and this week, we've screened the incredible film Mossville, When Great Trees Fall. Uh, it's a really, really impactful documentary, um, kind of highlighting uh, a, an incredible historic black community in Louisiana and some challenges that it faces when there's chemical pollution and some petrochemical plants coming in and taking over the entire community. So the film is still available uh, for free on our website until midnight tonight. Just go to newportfilm.com to RSVP and you will be able to watch the whole film. So in the meantime, no spoilers, um, but we're gonna be joined tonight by uh, the film's director, Alex Glestrom, who's here to tell you more about the film and also our artistic director and co-founder, Andrea Van Buren, who's here to ask some questions to Alex. So thanks so much for you guys joining us tonight. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Thanks, Becca. No problem. Sorry, I was muted there for a second. Um, so I'd like to introduce Alex. Um, Alex is an award-winning documentary filmmaker. Uh, he's directed, shot, produced, and edited a wide variety of film projects and has worked with broadcasters including HBO, CNN, Documentary Now, and NewYorkTimes.com. Uh, his work has ranged from commercial, music, and art videos to feature documentaries that have screened at both domestic and international film festivals and have collectively won more than a dozen awards. Alex is based in New Orleans and works closely with many of the local youth programs there, uh, volunteering his time. So welcome, Alex, and, and thank you so much for taking the time to be with us tonight, virtually at Newport Film. You're there? Thank you so much, I'm happy to be here. So I'm gonna get right into it. Um, I was listening to Michael Barbaro's uh, New York Times podcast just yesterday um, about why COVID is killing so many black Americans. And when they started talking about the reasons, I was just immediately reminded of Stacy and Mossville, um, that this area is part of, sounds like it's part of Cancer Alley, this 85 mile stretch where there are, there's the largest concentration of petrochemical companies in the country. And that the environment, and in this case, long-term exposure to air pollution is just one of the factors that black Americans are disproportionately more likely to face. Can you talk uh, a bit more about this? Yeah, of course. So um, you're absolutely right. From New Orleans, basically all the way to Houston is uh -oh. the Hey, Alex, you're cutting out a little bit. Uh oh. I think. Okay, so we just lost Alex for one second. He's going to put his mic back on, and I think we'll get him back in a second. I mean, basically what I was just saying is that these people have been, you know, subjected to air pollution and they're, they're just much more likely to develop these underlying conditions, which lead to, which make them more susceptible to, you know, getting COVID. So this was just yesterday. I was listening to this. If you heard this, I love Michael Barbar's podcast. The Daily. The Daily. Yeah. Shout out to Michael. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm sure we'll get lots of coverage from them. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> uh, so Alex is just going to hop back in in a second. But while we're waiting for him, we want to give a big thank you to Passion River Films for allowing us to stream this film. Um, and I think if you if you have the opportunity yeah. tonight, it's a really important story and one that definitely wouldn't be told without the incredible filmmaking team behind Hospital. So. Uh, we've been doing a lot of research and listening to a lot of the Q and A's that Alex and some of the producers and film subjects have been involved with. And um, it, it seems like uh, he was kind of an inspired to tell this story uh, really based off of, of a community need um, and getting involved with some local organ organizers. So we can't stress enough, you know, the importance of, of getting involved with local community organization um, for environmental issues. 
Yeah, so, it sounds like he volunteers his time um, creating content video, to fundraising videos to kind of help, um, you know, raise awareness about these nonprofits uh, in Louisiana. Yeah. And yeah. Alex back. Hey, sorry about that. I don't really know what happened. That's okay. <laughs> well, we're glad you're back. Uh, we were just chatting a little bit about. Can you, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you great. So we were just chatting a little bit about environmental activism and how that was a way that kind of inspired the the first people that you met uh, creating the film, uh, that the Mossville Community Organizing Group. Can you remind me of their name? Yeah, Mossville Environmental Action Now, or MEAN. Awesome. Well, so I, had, I was just talking about the New York Times uh, the daily podcast yesterday. I'm not sure if you had heard it, um, but it. Yeah. I listened to that as well. Yeah. So I just was wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about that. And um, it seems like there are many community communities that are being affected by these petrochemical plants. Um, you just, you started talking yeah, about how they were that they stretch from all the way to Houston, which I wasn't aware of. Yeah. New Orleans, Orleans to all the way from New Orleans to Houston, uh, and all the rivers that lead into them are filled with petrochemical plants and refineries. Um, and basically, the entire stretch of the way, all of the fence line communities that have to live next to these plants are color. You, you find very few white communities that are forced to live next to these these chemical plants. Um, and you're absolutely right. The same systemic inequities that are causing such high morbidity rates for black Americans from COVID are the same forces that cause them to be more likely to be denied clean air and clean water um, from the oil and gas industry. Mm. Yeah. Alex, can you tell us a little bit about how you got involved in the first place with Mossville? I lose y'all. We can hear you. Yeah, you sound good, Alex. Uh oh, I think he thinks he's lost us. Oh no. Having trouble connecting thing. Oh, um, you sound fine though. You can uh, hear me though? Yeah, you sound great. Okay, awesome. Cool. So we are just wondering how you first heard about the community and, and the problems going on in Mossville. So I was approached by an environmental rights lawyer named Monique Hardin. Um, she's kind of a, a hero in the environmental activism world in Louisiana. Um, she approached me after a panel discussion for my first film called Big Charity. And she came up to me and said, uh, I think I have your next film for you. Come with me. I want to take you to this place called Mossville. And so a couple of days later, I drove out to Mossville and um, she gave me an address and some phone numbers. And um, that's how it began. And she's she not only brought me to Mossville, but she's also been a mentor and kind of a guiding light for our film team throughout this entire process. Um, she's she's somebody that we call whenever we have questions. And she was also the first one who told us, you know, to really tell the story, um, you need to go to South Africa. So she, she kind of prophesied the entire project in a lot of ways. Yeah, I think that was a super powerful part of the film where suddenly you're realizing this isn't just a problem that's happening in the United States. This is a global problem. Exactly. Yeah, we were um, we were fortunate to get to South Africa. You know, we, we really made this film on a shoestring budget. Um, and it just so happened that I was shooting another film in Morocco. And so because I was already on the continent of Africa, we were able to find the funding to get me um, to South Africa, and we spent eight days being toured around the country by environmental justice activists, and it was really an incredibly impactful experience. You know, the the plants and the the smells and the sights are so familiar to me coming from Louisiana. You know, you could you could open your eyes, and if there weren't if there weren't accents from the people talking, you could feel like you're just right back home in Louisiana, which was really really a powerful experience for me. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Um, we have uh, a question from someone watching in the audience who's a professor at Salve Regina, which is the local university here in Newport. And he's asking you uh, if you think there's any hope of saving these communities or is it just a matter of maximizing operations? 
He's harassing me. He's harassing me. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do think that there is hope um, for saving these communities. I mean, I think that had had Mossville had some support from the surrounding communities and the people who hold power around here, then they would have had a much better chance. And I think it's incredibly important for people who do have power, who do have a say, who have money um, to be able to support these communities. And I think it, it really starts with supporting um, environmental justice, grassroots organizations, finding the community organizations that are most affected by this. Um, and, and, you know, I think that that's a great place to start. I think people often understandably want to donate to, to massive nonprofits when it comes to environmental issues, but I think finding an environmental justice organization that is near you, that's within your community, that is close to you and supporting them is incredibly important. Um, and then I think in general, we, the more that we can move away from fossil fuels as a society, as a, as a species, then um, the, the less we'll have to deal with these type of sad stories of communities being poisoned by these companies. Well, from what I've heard, it, it, it's, I, it sounds like the petrochemical companies are, are moving into the plastics kind of the plastics industry and um, these plants are kind of popping up all over the world. There was a, there's another film called The Story of Plastic. I'm not sure if you heard of it, but um, it addresses this situation with the petrochemical companies. Totally. Yeah. And I mean, I think that, you, you know, it's not realistic to, to expect that we're going to completely stop using plastic. Um, but I do think that at the same time we do, or most of us do want to have a society that is more equitable. So it, it isn't right, even if we are going to admit that we need some of these things, it, it shouldn't be that non-white communities have to suffer the burden at a disproportionate rate as white communities. Yeah. And I was really reached out to, oh, sorry. So, no, I was just curious if there had been any subsequent legal cases that have come up from different residents kind of banding together or if there's been any kind of some, you know, kind of action um, legally to, to help these communities out and these residents. Yeah, there have been some attempts, unfortunately, not very many successful attempts. In Louisiana, the oil and gas industry really has free reign to, to do what they want. And it's very hard to stand up to them legally. Um, first of all, it's hard to find local lawyers who will go up against them, especially in the Mossville, Lake Charles, Southwest part of the state, because you know these, these oil and gas companies, not only do they support the politicians, they support the schools, they support the hospitals. It's really hard to go up against them. Um, and there have been some class action lawsuits in Mossville, um, although none that have had major success. What we found is that one of the tactics that the oil and gas companies in this area use is when there will be a spill or a release. Um, you know, there was a lot of big um, spills into the groundwater in Mossville, chemical mm. spills, and Mossville folks drew water from from the groundwater because they have wells in their yards and they wash their kids in well water and and they're you know watered their gardens and they drank this water so they ingested all these chemicals and so what a lot of the oil and gas companies will do is when they do have a spill like this, they won't admit fault, but what they will do is they will offer buyouts to the residents. And they'll say, we, you know, we understand that these conditions have gotten really bad and we'll, we, we're giving you a way out. We'll give you this, this buyout offer. And so a lot of Moscow folks, you know, they see the money um, and an opportunity to leave and they take it. And what they don't realize is when they take that buyout offer, they are signing away any rights to sue for health related matters that may come up in the future. So what you see time and time again with Mossville folks is they take this buyout offer, they move to a different part of the state and they get cancer and they really have no recourse. Yeah. And some of the buyouts, at least the first one that was offered to Stacy was like incredibly insulting. Like here, there's $2,000 to leave your home. Yeah, it's so gross. It's so gross. And, you know, for a lot of folks in Mossville, these properties are passed down from generation to generation. And so, you know, they may be, some of them don't even have the actual deeds to the property. And, and when it comes down to it, they end up dividing these buyout offers between, you know, sometimes a dozen different siblings and people who are heirs of the great grandfather or grandmother who originally owned the property. That's terrible. When, when did you, uh, when did you stop filming? So when was the last time you had Stacy on screen? How long ago was that? Um, that was in 2016. 17 or 18, I believe. 
So how, how um, much longer did he last on that property? Um, so we followed Stacy's story on that property for about a year and a half. Wow. And, and was, when we got there, it had already really begun. You know, he was already one of the last people there. And very soon after our filming, he got cut off from utilities and water. Um, so yeah. we really, you know, kind of came in um, right as it was beginning to get bad for him. Yeah. That picture, you know, the the still that you're using to promote the film, that's pretty powerful image of his little plot of land. So how is Stacy doing uh, health wise? Stacy's struggling. Um, you know, I'd be lying if, if I said that he that he isn't still struggling health wise. Um, I got to see him just recently and it's it's amazing how much older he looks just in the past year or two. Um, and he still has a lot of health problems and um, he's still struggling. But, you know, he's a very resilient person. And just like he was the first day I met him, he's still cracking jokes and laughing. And he's such a he's such a charismatic, um, just just fun, you know, lighthearted person that uh, he doesn't let it get to him. He's a very resilient, strong person. And so even though he's still struggling, um, he still is, is fighting in ways that he can. He still is optimistic. And um, I hope people can look at his story, not as one of defeat, but of resilience. Yeah. We have um, another question uh, from someone watching who's asking, can you tell us more about your experience comparing Louisiana and South Africa? I think there's that, you know, incredibly beautiful uh, and really sad moment when the, the tree has fallen over in his yard. And, and I wonder if, if you saw those same kind of in, environmental impacts when you were in South Africa too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's so many similarities. I think in South Africa, it is, um, the situation is even worse for the people who live under the plants there. And, you know, apartheid is such, such more of a recent memory than, um, you know, than the Jim Crow South here. And so you have you have an even even smaller percentage of, of a white power structure controlling um, a greater black population. So it's, it's even and they also have even even fewer environmental regulations in South Africa than we do in Louisiana, which is surprising because I thought that they that they were so lax in Louisiana. And then we got to South Africa and it was just a whole nother level. Um, you know, when we were filming the plant in Secunda, the single biggest CO2 emitter on planet Earth, um, it was unlike anything I'd ever seen. It was really, really scary. We, we, we first saw that plant at night and we pulled in and it was the biggest plant I'd ever seen in my life. And the, the whole sky was full of smoke. And it was like, it was like the plants we see in Louisiana, but it was like a hundred of them put into one. And um, filming around there, my, my co-cinematographer ended up getting really sick and was, he was vomiting and he had a nosebleed. And I mean, the conditions are just really, really bad for the folks in South Africa, but they're also, because the anti-apartheid movement is so fresh in their minds, there's an incredible energy amongst the activists there. Um, we were really inspired by the people that we met in South Africa. They have an incredible organizing energy and there's, there's so many people who live under the plants that you know you, when you go to a meeting, you see a lot more people than you do at the meetings in Louisiana and people are fired up and there's a lot of energy. And um, when we got to go back and show the film in, Louis in South Africa, it was really, a beautiful moment. We got to bring my producer, Daniel Bennett, who's actually from Mossville. So he's a photographer and an activist himself. And I met him early on in my trips to Mossville and he became one of my number one co-collaborators. So him and I brought the film to South Africa to play at the Durban International Film Festival. And then we rented a car and drove back to Secunda and South of Berg and showed the film in the community centers with the characters we filmed with there. And that was a really incredible experience for us. People were, were so excited to see it. And, um, you know, South Africans are not quiet during movies, which I think is amazing. They are very, very um, animated and loud and cheering and hissing. And it was just a really exhilarating experience to show the film in South Africa. And we've since gave, gave a copy of the film to all the environmental activists. So they're continuing to have screenings to this day of the film and using it as an organizing tool. That's awesome. And, and so can, uh, Sassel was, they would not agree to be interviewed nobody in their company no unfortunately not we tried so hard to get them to and, so, and at one point they let us on like they were going to and then decided not to um so they, they wouldn't participate in the film they did constantly harass us throughout the production process and i, I can't remember if you brought up 
from the past the time we were in Moscow. I see. I, I can't remember if you brought up if these plants are, are um, this plant specifically is unionized and whether or not any of the people that are at the plants, working at the plants are getting, or at this point are, is getting sick, just like your friend oh, yeah. who was there for the day. Oh, yeah, I mean, for sure. Yeah, for sure. People, people who work at the plants, um, I think I saw something that was comparing the life expectancy amongst plant workers in Louisiana to non-plant workers. And it's, it's very, it, it's very harmful to work at these plants, but they pay. And I think you have a lot of people who don't have a lot of economic opportunities and they see this as a better, even though they know they're sacrificing their, their own health they see this as an opportunity to provide for their family. And so they take it and you know, I, I can't blame them for that. But it definitely does have really, really dangerous consequences for people who work in these plants. And not just, you know, I mean, just just the other day we had an explosion explosion of a plant near New Orleans and um, a couple people got hurt. You know, so you have the the dangers of of accidents that happen constantly there, explosions and fires and chemical releases. And then you just have the the ingesting of of um, fumes that people have to have to breathe in when they work there, which, you know, as Stacy says, he says it's like a tire with the air slowly, slowly coming out until it takes you off the face of this earth. And that's, that's what we saw with, with many people who we met in Mossville, whose parents worked at the plant and died at an early age. Mm. Yeah, I was sort of wondering, you know, early on, there's a statistic given that the population of Mossville was like 8,000 plus. And then by the time you finished filming, the population of Mossville is Zero, almost zero. Yeah, well, it's interesting because there's not, you know, Mossville doesn't, it was never an incorporated town. They were never allowed to incorporate. So they don't huh. actually have a, a hard line boundary as to where is Mossville and where isn't. You know, I mean, anybody who's from Mossville knows they're from Mossville or knows they're not from Mossville. Um, but so there's not, it was hard to find actual census numbers. Um, and so you still have people who lived in that area for sure. I mean, even though nobody lives right where Stacy was living, you still have many people who live in that area who are still um, forced to deal with all the consequences from these plants. And, you know, I mean, right now it's an especially difficult time to be there. I'm not sure how many people are aware of these recent EPA regulations that have been loosened during the lockdown, but, you know, these plants, when they were operating at a legal limit, you know, one another thing that, that the plants one of the ways that they're able to do what they do in that area is every plant has a legal limit of the amount of emissions that they're allowed to release. But the EPA doesn't enforce any sort of cumulative limit. So when you have a cluster of 14 plants in the area, even if they're all releasing their legal amount, the cumulative effect is very, very dangerous. And so to think that now all of those plants are allowed to spew out pollution with no regulation while people are supposed to be locking down next to those plants it's disgusting and it's criminal. And I, I think everybody should be outraged. And I, I hope this is just another reason for why we need a change in the federal administration for to not let things like this happen again. Mm -hmm. So are there things that we as Rhode Islanders can do to help make, make a difference? Yeah, I think there is. I mean, I'm, I haven't looked into who is near Rhode Island as far as environmental justice groups, but I would imagine that there is industrialization in Rhode Island. And I would imagine there are people who live near those plants. And I would think that supporting community justice organizations, environmental justice organizations that are most effective would be a great place to start. Another thing that, that we often suggest to people to do is, you know, if you're affluent enough to have investments, see where your money is being invested. You know, see if, see if your money is in a mutual fund that is supporting the oil and gas industry. A lot of us, without even knowing it, invest our money or have someone else invest our money and it goes into dirty industries. And even considering taking your money out of a big bank because big banks support the oil and gas industry. So I think putting your money where your mouth is is a really great step that people can take towards moving us away from fossil fuels. And then vote, please, please go vote. Please. <laughs> <laughs> For the people that that are did you know might be watching this post session at a at a later date um, and missed our screening window, can you let the audience know where they could see the film? Yes. So please follow us on our Facebook page, um, Mossville Film. Just look us up on Facebook, and um, we're, we're posting everything there. But we are going to premiere. We actually have our broadcast premiere with PBS on Memorial Day. So. 
the film will be um, broadcast nationally on PBS through their show Real South. Um, and then you can find it, you know, it'll be, it's a different time for every local listing. So you have to check your local PBS to see when it'll play, but you can also watch it through the PBS app at any time. Um, mm -hmm. and then after we do 90 days of streaming with them, we'll go on an Amazon or an iTunes so everybody can watch it. Um, we're also really excited. We have a screening coming up for the United Nations in Geneva. They're going to show the film, um, as a part of their working group on environmental racism and climate change. So we're really excited to, to see the film be used in that way. That's awesome. That's so great. Yeah. Alex, this has been really, really wonderful. The film is so beautiful and, and really powerful that we're, you know, we're so grateful for you to have shared this, um, this film with us and with our audiences. So if you didn't get the chance to watch it uh, yet tonight and you still have time, you can stream it through our website. Just head to newportfilm.com and RSVP. Then you'll receive in an email a link a unique link just for you to watch the film. Um, and please, please tell your friends and family about it um, because it's a really important message that everybody um, should should definitely be sure to see. And uh, we hope you'll catch us back here next week with another amazing film and another great Q&A. So on Monday, we'll be really releasing our next title. So be sure to follow us on social media to find out more. And thanks again uh, to Alex Glusterm for joining us. Thank you, Thank you Alex. Alex. For joining for the Q&A. This has been so great. And also thanks uh, again, Ryan and What's Up New for uh, promoting the stream as well. We really, really appreciate it. And we'll see you again next week. Thanks, thanks everyone. Guys. Thanks, y'all. Thank you so much thanks, for having, having yeah, me and showing the film. Everyone.